Godalming, or Godalming, as tourists like to say, is a quaint and quiet town, the town I grew up in, the town where Jude Law and Cameron Diaz graced our streets with their filming of the holiday. This historic market town can capture the hearts of anyone who visits. But I've come back for a specific mission, the mission to find out who Jack Phillips was and what he means to this town. At 11.40pm on the 14th of April, Lookout Frederick Fleet spotted an iceberg immediately ahead of the Titanic and alerted the bridge. First, Officer William Murdoch ordered the ship to be steered around the obstacle and the engines to be stopped. But it was too late. The starboard side of the Titanic struck the iceberg, creating a series of holes below the waterline. Five of the ship's watertight compartments were breached. It soon became clear that the ship was doomed and she could not survive more than four compartments being flooded. Phillips is commemorated in a number of ways around town, including the Godalming Museum, a memorial fountain, and a Weatherspoons named in his honour. The best place to find out about Jack was the Godalming Museum. I was lucky enough to talk to the chief curator at the museum, Alison, and pick her brains about Phillips. So this is the best known portrait really of Jack Phillips, and this was done posthumously of course, and done from a photograph. So over here we've got the photograph that it was done from. Uh, he's not, this is a time when having your photograph done is quite a significant thing uh, and you would get it done, you wouldn't do it within the family, most people didn't own a camera, so he went to a studio in Farncombe run by a photographer called Jenny Steadman and she took this photograph a couple of years before he sailed. I was intrigued to find out where the fault lay for the sinking of the Titanic. So when it comes to the dreadful night of the Titanic, um, uh, I read somewhere that he was fixing a wireless that had broken um, the night before or something. Um, was this uh, allowed? Would his supervisor, would have, was that something they would, were meant to do? Like Absolutely. Fix it themselves? Yes, that was part of the job. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because there were only the two of them on board, so if anything went wrong with the wireless, there's no one else on board who's able to operate it or fix it. So. Uh, that was part of his job, but he was up seven hours, I think, the night before yeah. the, the Titanic hit the iceberg, so mm. fixing the wireless. And if he hadn't, of course, there would have been no emergency messages at all. I think that he was kind of more irritable and kind of not ready to take these messages on board, or it's difficult to know. I think, I and mean, it does seem to be true that some ice messages didn't reach the captain mm. on on the Titanic. Um, but other ice messages did, so it wasn't that the captain was unaware that he was sailing into ice, it was just that he hadn't received all the warnings. Yeah. And the most famous one that didn't reach him didn't have the correct prefix, so when you send a radio message you need to prefix it with four letters that mean it's for the captain, or, yeah. or it's just a chatty message, or whatever it is. Yeah. And this wasn't prefixed with the lessons for the letters for the captain, so yeah. that may be why that didn't happen. Um, it may be, as well as being tired, he had a big backlog of all messages he hadn't been able to send while the wireless was broken. Yeah. So one thing he did once he fixed the radio was to take the next duty himself instead of taking time out. Yeah. He took the next, because he was a faster operator than his assistant, to send all the messages that were in the backlog. So it could be that he was a bit aware that he was short of time. And and when it actually came to the disaster, he was very much in control of what he was doing. And something that always sticks with me is that he was a very fast operator and he could send 30 words a minute. But he slowed that down to 15 when he was sending the emergency messages mm -hmm. um, because he wanted to make sure, he knew that not everyone could read at 30 mm -hmm. words a minute, so he wants to make sure that these messages reach as many people as possible mm -hmm. um, and that they can the other radio operators can tell by the, the, they can sort of get the sense of who's sending it from the, they call it their fist, the way they operate mm -hmm. the machine. So it was yeah. the same in the Second World War that um, they could recognise particular operators by their fist, by the way they actually physically tap the messages. Yeah. Um, and so the people receiving Jack's message uh, messages at the end said that his hand never shook on the on the Morse code machine, so he was wow. absolutely steady right to the end. So yeah. he may well have been over tired, but it wasn't affecting his sending, whether it affected his how polite he was to the other yeah. operators, maybe it did, yes. After speaking with Alison, I was in two minds. We were told he was right to fix the wireless, because even though this would have caused fatigue, 
they wouldn't have had a wireless to send out distress codes to the nearby ships. Jack sent these warnings to the bridge. However, the officers from the deck who survived to tell the tale said they were not delivered. But there was an investigation into the sinking of the Titanic, and the conclusion was that Captain Smith had failed to take proper heed of ice warnings, along with extremely high speeds, which was maintained, following numerous ice warnings. From my talk with Alison, I've come to the conclusion that I will never really know who was responsible. However, there is evidence of an extremely hard-working man that did his utmost to send the warnings, even when he was relieved of his duties, making him a godalming hero.